can't see you, <laughs> but you can see us. <laughs> So, hello, Planeteers. I am uh, Catarina Canelas. I'm a journalist at CNN Portugal. And now, it's uh, really an honor for me being here again with you today. Five centuries ago, uh, in the Discoveries Age, oceans made Portugal a big nation and a global player. Now, we have the same ocean, a new wave of opportunities, but also big threats and huge problems. Sea levels are rising. The ocean is more polluted than ever. It's warmer, acidification, with less oxygen. And we are killing marine species and biodiversity more than ever. And our speakers know exactly what, am I, what am, I am saying. So with us, Captain Alex Cornelison, Thank you so much for being here with, with us uh, again. Okay. And Hali Tabrizi. Did I say it OK? Tabrizi? Yep. Hali Tabrizi, yes. <laughs> uh, director of uh, uh, Seaspiracy Netflix documentary. So the third speaker uh, is in the US. He can't come and uh, be with us. So he says, sorry. But we are going to start now. So thank you so much for being here uh, with us as Planeteers today. And everyone in this room, I think, want to know um, all about you, but especially what you do and what your experiences and histories in the ocean and in this wave talk. So Captain Alex. <laughs> Uh, sea Shepherd does an amazing work in uh, protecting the oceans and its life. You have wonderful and amazing projects, and we will talk about all them. But there are two main projects uh, that touches me in person so deeply. There are, you work with uh, Mexican authorities and uh, leading researchers to save the vaquita. Correct. Yes. So it's the sweetest and the smallest cetacean in the world. And the second one, defending the pilot whales and other dolphins in faraway islands, mm -hmm. putting your lives at risk. And we know that you have some problems recently, and I want you to talk to us about that. And also knowing, telling us all that green exists, and it's terrible. And I would like you to talk to me about it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming. The, um, the Fakita project is actually now entering our ninth year of partnership with the Mexican authorities. Uh, the Fakita, is, as you said, is uh, it's a highly endangered uh, marine mammal. It's the most endangered marine mammal. We believe there's only about 15 individuals left, so it's even beyond critically endangered. And yet, every year we see there's still Fakitas out there, so every year our crew goes back there, there's a reason why they go back there, because we still have a chance to save the vaquita from extinction. Now, in entering our ninth year, so that means that eight years of efforts have prevented the vaquita from going extinct. So it shows that, you know, if a group of people care about a topic, we can make a difference. And we all uh, seen in the, the last weeks uh, and the last months uh, shocking images about what's happening in faraway islands. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the green. Uh, it's terrible. Uh, I don't believe that anyone who sees those images can be impartial to that. Uh, can you tell us about what are you covering there? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. And because you need courage. And I know you were suffering a lot, your teams there. Yeah, the Grind is a, um, it's actually something that started some 500 years ago in the Faroe Islands. The locals would kill pilot whales who'd come to their shores, and 500 years ago they would go out in wooden boats and they would kill a few Grind or pilot whales that would come and they would use that meat to feed the community. Now we're 500 years later and some traditions need to disappear from the planet and this is clearly a tradition that has no place in modern society. And in fact, the locals are no longer eating the pilot whale meat. They're eating it in very small quantities because the pilot whale meat, just like all major predators in the ocean, contains high level of mercury and other toxins. 
So by consuming too much pilot whale meat, you're actually poisoning yourselves. They say, oh, it's a tradition and we are sustainable. Yeah, we used to kill people. Uh, that was also tradition. We used to have the, uh, the Norman used to come from uh, Sweden and Norway into Europe and they would rape and pillage and destroy and loot villages. That's a tradition that luckily has disappeared. So there's other traditions that have to go into the history books of society. And this is clearly a tradition that has no place in modern society. So, well, you have been in Faroe Islands also in your documentary, Seaspiracy. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, you work together, Sea Shepherd and, and you in your documentary. So, you are a team. So, uh, how did you, a director, a common guy, uh, with your convictions, just yourself, um, you thought, okay, I have to do something. So, how did Seaspiracy burn? Mm. Well, I really distinctly remember the, the trip to the Faroe Islands in order to film the whale hunt. It was one of the most iconic scenes from the entire film, which people you know, around the world that I speak to still bring it up with me and how much it affected them. It's a very emotional scene. Um, there is a lot of blood, unfortunately. We, we, have, we had about three hours of this footage, which we had to basically sh only show about one minute of in the, in the entire documentary. Um, but the process of filming it was extremely difficult because it doesn't happen on a set time of the year. It could happen at any point if they ever find a pod of whales going past. So you think about this as a documentary team. You're going to a country that you have no idea if it's going to happen. You're spending money staying there. And we, we were ending up, uh, we, we booked a trip for 10 days to the Faroe Islands, you know, wondering if we would be there while it happened. And on the ninth day, I said to my co-director, Lucy, um, I'd hate to be on the flight back home and it happened below us on the, in the ocean. And sure enough, on the 10th day, that's what happened. So for, uh, it was on the 11th day, sorry, so we booked our trip. And we had driven to the other side of the island, and it was extremely uh, stressful because you know what you're about to witness, and, and you know, you're making sure you've got your cameras ready, and you're sort of panicking, and you're trying to drive safe, and it's raining. And um, I just remember just the, the, the sort of tension that was in the air as everyone would have, from the in, entire Faroe Islands had driven over to participate in this blood sport. It was disturbing to be around and sure there's enough children there. there's children there there's mothers they're posing on the dead whales afterwards and you know just you know people who have seen the movie can, can understand how it all happened and then people are roaring as they as they take up these whales and are slaughtering them it's, it's a really barbaric thing to witness and after we'd filmed it we were also concerned that um, the police would find us and take away our footage because I'm not sure if it passed into law, but when we went there, we had just heard that it would it kind of become illegal for non-Danish citizens to be on the beach during the Grind, and that's what we were going off of. And so I remember taking the memory cards out of the cameras, and we, we'd borrowed this car that was falling, to, falling apart, and there was a little rip in the, in the chair, and I was shoving the memory cards down the side of the, the chair in the fabric so if the police found us, and they circled us a few times. It's not, it's not in the movie, but there was a lot of just tension around it, and I remember just the... It was almost like a PTSD moment afterwards because the co my co-director Lucy was in a state of terror of what she'd witnessed. You know, this is something that we'd want to stop, but here we are just watching it, and it was really heartbreaking. And I went into complete emotional shutdown, and I was just, I was just gone, and I wasn't really not, you know, I just completely disconnected from what I'd just seen because it was just so awful and so traumatic, and I think I'm still trying to process what, what on earth is going on there. Um, as we were making the entire film, it was always like this. You're seeing these really graphic and intense um, things that are really, they really take away your hope and um, time and time again you, you, you sort of have to, or you end up just shutting down a lot and um, that's just part of the process of making these kinds of films unfortunately. Uh, so uh, I ask you uh, here in the, in the public, uh, who saw Seaspiracy? Can you rise up? Okay, okay, almost, almost everyone. So uh, what were the biggest challenges, the biggest difficulties but also the good surprises that you find out in your documentary. We are talking about four years mm -hmm. and a half of shootings. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of footage that we didn't use. Um, you know, in the film, it looks like we're in Japan just for a couple of days. We were actually in Japan for a couple of months. <laughs> And it's, it, you know, we didn't go with any plan. We would just arrive and just start filming and we'd meet someone and they'd say, hey, check this thing out down the road and then we'd go film. Um, and, you know, some of, the, some of the shocking moments that still stay with me are, um, are these moments like the Faroe Islands or Taiji or what's happening out at sea. Um, but someone, some of them that stick with me are speaking to some of the slaves that had escaped working on fishing boats. I think there's about 20 million people 
at sea who are in a forced labor situation. And uh, we got to speak to just a few of them that, that had escaped. And the things that they were telling me were so heartbreaking. One of them was, uh, I was about 23 when I was doing this interview with these uh, ex-slaves. And one, this guy was also 23. And our lives had been completely paralleled. Um, and he told me about the experiences that he had at sea. And another guy had told me, I was at sea for 10 years, two months, and two days. And he could tell me every single day and, and, and you know, being completely shut off from your families and learning about all the treatment. And that, and that, really, that really stuck with me. But one of the challenges of making a film like Seaspiracy is that it's not happening on land. We couldn't just, you know, sometimes we could walk up to an office that had been, you know, a fishing industry corporation or something like that, but it was extremely difficult to be able to get out to sea and witness this stuff. And that's where this sort of collaboration with Sea Shepherd came in because they had all this footage and they, they, they brought us onto one of their boats. Uh, we were filming off the coast of Liberia, this in, incredible uh, illegal fishing that's happening out there. And I think without Sea Shepherd's footage and ability to go out on their boats, the film wouldn't have been the same. Um, and, and, and I think that's why I applaud an organization like Sea Shepherd because there are such few eyes at sea or on the ground looking at this stuff that that became the big challenge for making an ocean documentary. When we, we think about Sea Shepherd, we think about, okay, these guys are protecting the oceans, these guys, they don't have afraid. They have courage, and they go, and they fight. And, and that's amazing, because you have lots of missions, I know. And one of the most recently, uh, I'm a journalist, I did some reports about it, was the Stop Finning. Mm -hmm. And the stop finning is one of your flags, and, and not also. The marine protect areas are other of your main subjects and your main, as a, your main atten attention. Mm -hmm. The 3030, can you explain that to us? You want to talk the about finning yeah, the finning and then the marine areas, because all is connected. Right, so Sea Shepherd was part of a coalition, a European in the EU, in the European uh, Union where we got all EU countries to vote on the ban of the import of shark fins into Europe. Actually, the trade of shark fins. There is a massive trade of shark fins happening in the EU. So we're not only getting the shark fins from the fishing industry, but also from foreign companies who are shipping it through Europe. So what we're trying to do with the initiative is to stop the trade of shark fins through Europe. And just two, a few days ago, we found out that we made our quota. We've been officially certified that we made more than a million signatures. That means that we can now go to Brussels and defend our case before the European Commission. And hopefully the European Commission will now act and stop the trade of shark fins in Europe, which will be a massive blow to the shark finning industry. And it was amazing because lots of... Thank you. Thank you. They deserve it. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was amazing because, because lots of people joined. Millions of people in the world say something about it, mm -hmm. but for people who are here that don't know what is finning, I think it's, it's, it's great if you explain it, because we need to know yeah. uh, also one thing, that we are in Portugal, and we Portuguese are one of the biggest consumers in the world of sharks. But sometimes we don't know we are eating sharks because we give sharks other names. Like, for instance, Tinturaira, it's shark. So can you explain to us what this animal can suffer and what, what's, what's the main point of mm -hmm. this? Because there is no point. Yeah, when you... The uh, traditions. As you mentioned, that sharks is being consumed all around the world, only that the fishing industry will give it different names. Because if you say you're eating shark, none of us is going to eat it. So we give it... We call it uh, rock salmon in the UK, fish and chips. We have all these different names that are used to actually promote the sale of shark meat because there's this massive industry, the shark finning industry, where the estimates range from 73 to 274 million sharks every single year that are being killed by the fishing industry for the shark fins. And the act of shark finning is one of the most barbaric acts you can imagine. Sharks are being caught and sharks are very powerful, they're very strong, and they survive being caught on the hook, being dragged on board, and then even survive it when their fins are being cut off. So they're being thrown back in the water without their fins. Imagine your limbs are being cut off and you're being thrown back into the ocean. Well, we would bleed to death immediately and die. The sharks don't. They sink to the bottom of the ocean where they suffocate. That's the way they die, not because of their 
fins being detached, detached is because they die of suffocation because they can no longer move through the water. So it's, it's a horrible way to die. It's an agonizing image. And it's, it's, it's horrible, and you know, and, and the good thing about being with Sea Shepherd, and we're very happy with, uh, with Sea Spiracy coming out, because it showed the work that we were doing, and we recognized our work in a lot of what we see. But there's also campaigns that, that we haven't the chance to film, for instance, the, uh, the Canadian seal hunt, the biggest slaughter of marine mammals on the planet. Uh, 300,000 seal pups every single year, seal babies, that are baby harp seals, are being butchered to death, skinned alive by the fishermen. And the shark finning, it's, it's, it's horrible, horrible, horrible. And to see that, being with Sea Shepherd, you see all these acts of cruelty that we as humans are inflicting upon fellow living creatures of this planet. But and then we also have solutions. And, and, and the marine protectarias, it's one of the main solutions. Yes. What are you doing about this? And what do you think the way we are in the right way? We we are not, there's something missing, or we can really do this. What about your experience? Yeah, so in essence, the marine protected areas, the, everybody knows 30 by 30, 30% 30 of our oceans will be protected by 2030. Fantastic idea. The problem is, it's on paper. And a lot of these marine protected areas, they are, for instance, saying you can't surf here, or you can't swim there, or you can't use your kayak there. These are all very low impact activities in the marine protected areas. What they should be is no take zones. No fishing should be allowed at all inside the MPAs. So that requires enforcement, and that's where Sea Shepherd comes in. So by partnering with governments around the world, we are providing that critical component to make sure that the MPAs are, in fact, marine protected areas by providing enforcement. And do you think the governments, the, the governments are really there? They are certainly there. When you see that we have eight partnerships in uh, Africa, working with eight different countries in Africa, getting law enforcement officials from these countries on board to patrol their waters uh, in the last six years resulted in the arrest of 80 illegal fishing vessels. So that's 80 slaughterhouses that we shut down and counting. So these are very effective, and we're further expanding into the Mediterranean. We have two partnerships. A third we're about to announce in the Mediterranean. So there's a lot of work, and thanks Good to the news. support of people Good around the world, we, yeah, we can keep doing it. Good news are coming in. So talking about news, Hali, uh, people reaction to Seaspiracy documentary shocked you. We, 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 we have the opportunity to talk some minutes before this talk. Why did it shock you? And in, in what way? Yeah, so when I set out to make this film, I had no idea that it would end up on Netflix. And after two years, we found out that Netflix wanted it. Um, but even still, I thought that it would be buried under the very big pile of movies that people like to watch <laughs> on Netflix and that no one would watch a movie about fish. Uh, it, just, it just didn't seem like it was cool enough or something. Um, but sure enough, within a couple of days of its release, it soared rapidly to one of the top 10 movies on Netflix in about 50 countries. It broke headlines around the world, was trending on Twitter. We had so Paul McCartney of the Beatles sharing it. We had Kourtney Kardashian sharing it. We had pretty much every A-list celebrity that I could think of sharing it on their Instagram pages and reaching out to us and just showing their support. And it was phenomenal and I still to this day I'm shocked by the response um, and I think there was something about Seaspiracy that connected with people um, I think we're often we're often told big stories about you know the environment that we you know kind of feel powerless about or often those documentaries very seldom go into real solutions that people can like get their hands involved with and I think for Seaspiracy we, are, we, we reduced a very very big broad problem that affects our ocean into some really simple solutions that I think anyone could could um, adopt, um, and I think that just still surprises me. And the aftermath was that we had um, people around the world emailing us. We had about like five emails every minute coming through for a long period of time. You know, people from small fishing villages in Japan telling us that they've now sort of reduced their fish intake and they want to be vegan. And there was a supermarket in Hong Kong that had taken seafood off of their shelves. You're, see, you're seeing already changes. It, it was huge, yeah. I mean, one, one vegan tuna company secured $26 million in investment, which is incredible, which is what we need to see more of. You know, I don't want people to have to sacrifice um, to have to help the ocean. You know, what's really great about 
this solution to the ocean is that it's a really delicious thing. You know, just shifting what you're eating from this thing on the supermarket shelf and purchasing that thing on the supermarket shelf. And it seems very, very simple. And that's because it is. But it has, it, it means the world to these animals. You know, every time we kill these animals, we take their world away from them. And I think it's just such a beautiful thing. You know, who do we want to be as human beings? Do we want to just march around killing everything we want because you just want a sandwich and just a little snack to eat? Or do we want to act more lovingly? Do we want to behave more lovingly? And, and I think Seaspiracy showed some truth and people, I think it spoke to the, the better nature. And I think I just, you know, give people the credit to make their own decisions and be more loving. You work for changes and, and for awareness also. Did you have people uh, talking with you and having doubts saying, oh my God, I trust that label? Oh, of course. Yeah, that was, you know, the dolphin safe tuna labels is something that people still talk to me about. Um, and the MSC labels. And I think, it just, I think we can all connect to this idea that you know, we're, we're constantly being lied to by the media, by our governments. And I think it was just one of those extra things that we just didn't want to accept we were being lied to about because it just took away some of our guilt and made us feel a little bit better and gave us some good feelings that we were eating something really sustainable. And I think Seaspiracy shattered that concept really in a big way. Um, so, uh, you know, of course, these are still about on supermarkets today. You can still buy things, but I think they, they're reduced, they're, they're, their days are numbered. I think people are starting to see through the lies. You know, I have a, um, this is a talk, we are, we are talking with each other, and, and I have a confession to make. In 2020, I did a documentary called Plastic Novo Continent, Plastic the New Continent, and I saw in loco uh, shocking images and things happening, um, animals being killed, um, rivers, with no water, just plastic and litter, the sea, uh, the pollution of the sea and the beaches, and everything was shocking me so much. Then one day I crashed, and I thought to myself, what am I doing? What am I doing? Because this is, this is too much, this is, this is huge. And, and, and then I, I just look up and I thought, okay, I have to breathe. Okay, so wonderful. It's so good that I'm seeing this. It's so good that I'm shocked with this. And this hurts my skin and my heart because that's why I'm doing this, to show people the real dimension of things and what we, what we have to do. And there's hope because there are solutions. And with your experiences in the field, I want to know, did you ever feel something like this? Uh, and did this lack of hope, but then hope again, push you to go on and go on and go on? And that's why we are all here. Yeah. So did I ever find, sorry. Did you, did you have a moment when- A moment of despair? You, you thought, you are despair. There's, there's no hope, okay? I'm, this is- How do I feel despair? Yes. No, I think it's, when you, when you do what we do at Sea Chef, and I mean, I've been doing this work for t more than 20 years, it's kind of like a balance, uh, you know, on one hand you see the beauty of the, you know, we get to travel to the most beautiful places in the world with our ships. Uh, we are on board, uh, we're kind of living in a bubble, they're like-minded people, they're activists from all over the world who really care about what's happening to the planet and really want to make a difference. So it's a very inspiring environment. And then if you then encounter an illegal activity or animal suffering, then as a group you know how to deal with it and you take action and you make a difference. And I remember my very first day on board a uh, Sea Shepherd vessel was in the Galapagos in 2000, July 2000. And we left at midnight. We had dolphins riding in bioluminescence, the bow waves of the ship. You could see these ghost shadows of dolphins. It was the most amazing, magnificent sight. And then the next morning, we got woken up uh, that we found a long line, an illegal long line inside the Galapagos Marine Reserve. And we started pulling in the long line, and before we knew it, there was a turtle that was entangled with its flipper around one of the buoys. And somebody said, somebody needs to go into the water to free the turtle. And nobody acted, so I dove in and, and personally saved the turtle from, from certain death. Now, that was my very first day on board a Sea Shepherd ship. Now, I'm not saying every day is as good as that, but for me, certainly, that kept me going for these 20 years. And when I see our crew on any campaign, and I see that they're saving an animal, and I see the look in their eyes, I recognize myself in that first day. You know, that's why you're doing this, that, that hope that, you know, you actually can make a difference. Just believe that you can, and you will. Thank you for sharing that with us. And, and, and Hallie, 
Uh, I ask you the same, but uh, we, we also talked about one thing. This can be uh, a lonely walk, mm -hmm. and we feel like um, lonely. Uh, and and when we see other people, our families, our friends that weren't there, there's like a, a gap. That's like, right. Yeah. You don't feel the same thing because you didn't you didn't experience it. For sure. So what's great about um, what Alex described is this uh, sort of you've got a little bubble, of almost like a floating community out at sea who's, who's out there protecting the ocean. It's a great environment. And I've, I've been on the seashell a few times with the boats, and it is a great environment. Um, making a film, on the other hand, is, is an incredibly lonely pursuit. Um, you know, you're spending several years, in this case, making a film, and you've got all this horrendous, harrowing footage. and. You've also got facts that you're really excited about sharing and have just blown your mind and changed you as a human being and experiences that have, you'll carry throughout your whole life. And then you get home to the editing studio and you've just got to wait until it's done. And, and all these experiences that you've had, no one else has seen. So they don't, you know, all the way through making the film, no one had really known where I'd been or witnessed what I'd witnessed and you know, the, the, the trauma almost of, of seeing this stuff. And it can be an incredibly lonely process where almost like your friends and family sort of don't know who you are anymore. And there's just the loneliness of you in the studio making this film. And um, there's, it's, it's just an incredibly learning process that can be hard when you're tackling these kind of subject matters and you're trying to make sense of the world in that sense. Um, but there was almost a little bit of retribution in, in the release of the film where finally it was shared. And it was almost like a cathartic moment of like, OK, <laughs> it's your film now. <laughs> you know? yeah, we, need, we need to see spiracy every single year. Because for us, as, as activists, uh, what we've been doing for years Spiracy coming out was a massive support for us. You know, you could see that a lot of people saw it, even the Kardashians yeah. commented on it. So it reached millions of people worldwide and it really, you know, put the issue of illegal fishing and, and ocean destruction on the map. Yeah. And so we're always saying every single year we had a Spiracy, it would be great for marine conservation. <laughs> you know, I will have another confession to make. Uh, my grandmother is 82 years old. We are from the north. My grandmother doesn't know how to read, but uh, even the, the documentary was with subtitles. She doesn't know how to read, so I show, him, show her the documentary, and we were telling her the story, and she cried, and she felt it, and she has 82 years old. So I think this, this says a lot of your work, your work, and the work that so many people in the world are doing and in inspiring us. So we have climate change, human activities causing the, the, the health of the oceans uh, to decline at an alarming rate right now. Where do you, you think we can be in, I don't say five years, I say two years, Captain? Well, in two years, if we continue down the road that we're on as humans, as human species living on this planet, then we're going to see a further diminishment of species. We're going to see more and more animals disappear from the planet. More species are going to go extinct. Uh, we have a stand here called Extinct Inc., where we offer tattoos that are basically a, a bullet board to people saying, if you get a tattoo, you show all these animals have gone extinct over our lifetime. And the numbers are increasing and the, the rate is accelerating. So we're really pushing species into extinction worldwide. So if we keep do going down this road, we're going to see less and less biodiversity. And we're going to see more and more climate change. And, and that's going to really affect uh, everybody around the world. I mean, I live in the Netherlands. My house is built uh, four levels below, below sea level. So I'm very worried about global warming because if the water keeps rising, eventually Holland will be on the water. But picture, and we in Holland, we build dikes, so we're okay for now. But picture you live on the Maldives or anywhere else in the Pacific where the water is already becoming to a critical level. These people are starting to lose their houses. They're starting to lose their future. So it's already there. You know, what we're going to be seeing in the next two years, I think storms are going to increase, global warming and climate change is going to intensify. So we really need to act now. Yeah, because the time was yesterday. And what do you think about it, Hallie? Uh, if there, were, there will be maybe a conspiracy too, uh, not in two years, it's difficult, but what do you think about the future? 
I echo what Alex has said. Um, sometimes I just wonder what morning am I going to wake up and it's going to say, okay, that was the last Vaquita gone. Um, there's also other um, you know, dolphins in New Zealand. That are, there's now only 50 left. We're losing species faster than we can even acknowledge their existence. I think we just found a new whale in the US. Is that right, Alex? Yeah, Did you hear about this? And yeah. we've just discovered a new whale species and it's already, we already found that it's, uh, it's threatened with extinction. Um, it's, it's hard to say where I'd like to be, where, where, what I would see happening in two years. I just think that the more are the same. Um, I, I actually don't see much change come from governments. I just don't. I mean, we, we have three calls to action. We, we'd like people to make more of a shift uh, in, their, in their daily diet choices to more, towards more plant-based options. Um, and we'd also like governments to remove subsidies from the fishing industry and also help with a 30 by 30, uh, create 30% 30 no-take zones. But so far, I'm just not seeing any movement from government to really do it. It's just not on their political agenda. They don't want to, you know, these are a lot of the times we forget that politicians have a career. It's their career politicians and they have their own interests. And I sometimes, I just, I, I question how, what the time zone will be before they actually start taking action on this stuff. It's often 50 years too late. <laughs> um, so that's why I put a lot of emphasis on like individual action at the moment, just because the track record for government has been not very good. So yeah, shifting uh, what we eat is a great thing and um, supporting organizations like Sea Shepherd. You know, the documentary's out there. It's a vehicle for change. You can always share it. Um, we have social media. That's what I'd like to do, but um, it's hard to say. But what do you think we need to do more? Because we talk Obviously. about awareness, education, we talk about governments, industries, okay, the decision makers, but we are all humans, we mm. are persons, uh, before we decide or in, 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 in every mm. sector we, we could be or work, what, what is the main problem? This is the thing, I think, I think we want a big red button where we can just press it and fix it and they're like, let's just do more, let's just do more, let's just do more, but it, it comes down to, okay, what do I actually want to do? You know, because I can't expect someone else to do more if I'm not willing to do more. And I think if we can find out and figure out what we're excited about in life and what we're passionate about or what we're good at doing and what ideas we have, and then we apply that, that's going to be better. I think the reason why I came into what I'm doing is because, you know, I, I was always interested in, in, in filmmaking and cameras and also had a, a love for the environment and just went for it without any expectation of outcome. I didn't realize anyone would ever watch the movie. I kind of wanted to answer those questions for myself when I made the film and it just so happened that a lot of people wanted to know the answers of why the ocean was dying as well. I think anyone that gets into ocean conservation or those kinds of spaces kind of do it for the same reasons. They just are interested in it and they go for it and they just... They, they don't worry about criticism too much, and they just do what they love. And I think if more of us did that, we'd be in a better position, rather than worrying about what our parents might think if we did this or that. And I think there's just a lot of fear in our decision making. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. And you, Captain, what do you think? Because you live in the ocean for 20 years, at least. Yeah, I think that you know people need to realize, and, and most people here do realize it already. But you know, we as individuals, we do have the power to make a change. You know, we can change things. We can't change global warming, it's not in our hands. It's, the problems are too big if we think about, oh, we're gonna stop uh, ocean acidification or global warming or overfishing, then the problem becomes too big to even envision. But we can make a difference. We can say, okay, I'm gonna target this small problem, problem locally. And everybody has something that we're passionate about. And by focusing on something locally or nationally or even internationally, but focus on something that you're good at that you think you can make a difference, and that's the best you can do, really. You don't, you don't need to be the person that's going to change the planet. That's small just... Small actions can... can small can actions will lead big to big changes. results. Exactly. No, and yeah. we, we, we talked this morning about acting locally uh, to change globally. And I think many people didn't understand that yet. Yeah, I mean, when I first joined Sea Shepherd in 2002, uh, you know, I, I joined as a chief cook. I never imagined myself to be the CEO. It's, I didn't plan this, it just happened. And, and so, you know, everybody just go down your road and, and, and just, but feel passionate about something. Don't, don't just think, oh, well, the problem is too big, I'm just not gonna bother anymore. Because then you've already given up and then, then, then there's no more hope. There's always hope. And you didn't think that the Kardashians could, could uh, <laughs> share in Instagram your, your your doc, uh, we, we are laughing about this and we have to talk this with, uh, with, with this softness, but, but we are talking about uh, really um, major problems and huge problems that we are facing. Um, we, we have our time almost running out and I, I want you to, 
to ask you if you have a, a, a key message to inspire and to warn people of what they could think and they could do when they get out of this room, Captain Alex. Well, I normally would say think about changing your diet, but I think a lot of people here are already thinking about that. But then I go outside and I see there's all these food trucks and they're all serving animal protein. And I'm thinking we're here at a Planeteers event, at an event where we're thinking about the future of the planet. Why come we didn't make those food changes here already? We could have done that here. So we should lead by example. You know, we should be the initiator of change. And we, as individuals, as a group, as event organizers, anywhere you are, you know, make sure that you are that example to, to inspire people, to generate change. I think that's the most important message I can give. And Helly, what can you say to these people that almost, almost these people saw your documentary and now you are here in person and, mm. and you can talk by, with your soul? Well, to be, to be honest, I don't have much more to add. I don't think, you know, this is an, an element of inspiration. I think it's just, um, you know, we, I think we all know what we've got to do. I think we've all got a pretty good idea of, of the challenges and the problems and, and what we can be doing. Um, you know, life can be difficult a lot of the time. You know, we've got jobs to think about and families to think about and school to think about. And sometimes it could be like, okay, I'm already struggling in my own life to get my grades or to get my paycheck and pay rent. Now I have to think about trying to save the planet. Like, you know, it's just, it's just, a, it's just a lot on people's plates at the moment. Um, and I think just for me, it, it, it's always come down to, at least in my personal life, you know, realizing that life is finite on this earth for us. We don't know how long we've got. Um, we've got our body and we've got some time. Um, and just figure out, you know, what would be the best use of that? You know, what can you, you know, what do you want to do so that, you know, when you're a bit older, you can look back and just be, you know, glad that you did it and, you know, not, not living a life that you're just acting out of fear all the time, not wanting to do things and, you know, just, just being worried what people might, might be thinking. I think that's one of the worst traps to get into. I think there's something that, that ties a lot of people that I find inspirational together and they, they generally, they generally don't really care too much about what, cri like, critics say. They take on feedback, but they don't let that stop them. Um, and so if there's one thing, if you're really passionate, if you're sitting there and you've got an idea for something, you're just not sure if it's gonna work, I've been there, um, and the best I can say is, is you know, trust that little voice in you that's saying, you know, go for it, um, and, and see if you can align those passions with trying to you know, help others in some way, help the planet in some way, help others, help your family, help something. Um, so I'd, I'd say start with that. When you think in the ocean, uh, give me one word to describe ocean, one word. Dying. And you, Captain, Sorry? one word to describe ocean. When you think in ocean, give me one word to ocean. This is a difficult question. Yeah. But you, you, you will I'd do like it. To, I'd like to, uh, some of you might not get it because you're too young, but I'll link it back to the Planeteers. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Captain Planet. Uh, and it's Planeteers, yeah? Well, we need Captain Planet to stand up and make a change. So, Planeteers, we're all Planeteers. Let's get together and make sure that we can save the ocean. So the word, Captain Planet, Planeteers. You don't need to wear nothing to, to be a hero and to be, and to be a, a Planeteer. So we have to remember we, we hit ocean. We breathe ocean, we can't live without ocean, and we need to protect the ocean because we only have one. <laughs> There's no many oceans. There's only one, and I think it's, it's our legacy to the future yes. and to the future generations. So we all could be planeteers, that's why we are here today, all of us. So thank you, all of you, and let's go together, and I hope next year we can be all together again, like planeteers and like heroes, and saying to little children, they could all be heroes, planeteers, and Captain Planets. Thank you so much.